We serve an awesome, awesome God. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn with me to Psalm 67, which will be our main scripture that we will read together this morning. I uh, apologize in advance if I get emotional this morning, and you cannot be crying here on the front row. It's going to make it worse for me. So uh, just overwhelming uh, what we experienced this week, and so excited to share some of that with you this morning. Uh, we will get back to the life of David next Sunday, and so uh, we will continue our Courageous Faith series through the life of David. We will finish that up in November, so excited to uh, preach those last number of messages from David's life. And then after Thanksgiving, of course, Advent is here. I know it's hard to believe that the Christmas season is upon us, but that starts on December the 1st, and so we'll have some resources for you and some dates and times coming up for the holiday schedule, uh, but just wanted you to know that all of that is ahead of us, and we're excited about that as a family. Well, let me give you a report from Tanzania. As I shared with you, uh, our church family collectively really uh, blew World Vision out of the, out of the water uh, by sponsoring 377 children last Sunday. So thank you, thank you for that. In fact, we sponsored so many kids that they actually uh, took half of us uh, to the Nabarera community that I mentioned last week, and the other half to the Cassandra AP, which is another part of Tanzania, and <laughs> sponsored children there. So we have two different areas, but all in Tanzania, where we are sponsoring children. And if you put that together collectively, this is what blows my mind, um, because for each one of us, you know what I said last week is, let's do for one what we wish we could do for all. And so for each one of us, you know, sponsoring one, two, three kids, we're doing what we can do. But when you put it all together collectively as a church family, we are collectively giving $176,000 a year to the children of Tanzania. So thank you for stepping out with courageous faith to do that. Now, when we uh, got to Tanzania, we um, drove out with the team for the choosing party uh, where they were going to participate and show us how it would work. And um, it was amazing to arrive in this village, and they welcomed us with traditional African dancing and singing, and it was very uh, overwhelming, just the warm welcome that they gave us. And the first tent that we went to was packed full of people, so kind of like we're packed in here today. Uh, they were packed into this tent and got to see all of these smiling faces uh, looking at us, uh, across the, the, the tent. Can we show that picture? And uh, it was amazing just to be able to see all the families there and the children there. And then they took us to the next tent, which was where they had set up the, the chosen uh, process, and they had all the pictures lined up uh, one after another uh, in this tent. And so we went in there, and you can see there's about 30 at a time that they had set up on these clotheslines with the clothespins. And so it's, it's a little bit surreal to travel halfway around the world and to look and see pictures of a lot of y'all <laughs> in this little village in Tanzania. Um, and it was amazing. Of course, there were some pictures from some of the other churches we were with, but there was a lot of y'all's pictures here as well. And uh, then they would bring in five children at a time into the, the choosing tent, and they would kind of explain to them what they were going to be doing. And you could tell that the children were a little confused, and they explained to us that for these children, uh, that this was the first time in their lives that they had been asked to choose anything. And so you, you'd see them go up, and they'd look at all the pictures, <laughs> and then they would point at the one that they wanted to be their sponsor, and of course, the little kids uh, couldn't get the <laughs> picture off there, so the workers would go help them take it off, and the big kids would pull it off, and they would get their picture taken with the family that they had chosen to be their sponsor. And so the, the child that chose us was uh, Ibrahim, and so he went up there and got our family, and uh, 
uh, beautiful child, beautiful smile, beautiful, beautiful people, joyful and loving, just with significant material and spiritual needs in their community, right? And so a lot of the children were very thin. Um, they were small for their age. And they just said that was because of a lack of good nutrition, right? And that's part of why we're there and part of why World Vision is there. And so uh, we got to meet Ibrahim and his mother and his siblings. And of course, I couldn't get Barry away from the babies. And so uh, they wanted to touch her face. They had, you know, the little ones had not seen that complexion of skin before or hair color. And so they were wanted to touch all of that. And I said, Barry, you cannot bring them home with us. They stay here. And then I uh, got to see uh, you know, several siblings together that we got to take some pictures with, and they were just so joyful and, and welcoming to us. It was a really beautiful, beautiful, beautiful time. World Vision, uh, as they showed us here in Tanzania, works in very remote areas. They have a tagline for their ministry there. They say, we go to where the road ends and we keep going. And Jack, they do. <laughs> <laughs> we uh, were staying in Arusha, which is a large city in northern Tanzania, and about 15 minutes outside the city, the pavement ends. So it's paved road in the city. You get about 15 minutes out of the city, you're on dirt road. And I'm using road loosely. You, you get on the dirt road. And we drove three hours on the dirt road. And then you turn off to where you're headed toward the village, and you can't even call it a road. Like, you're on a path that basically they created to get out to where these villages are. And what's so impressive about World Vision Tanzania is not just that they go where others don't, but they stay there until the work is completed. They have a track record of a 15-year game plan to help these villages get to sustainable solutions for their needs. We were blown away by the incredible staff that we met at World Vision Tanzania. The national and the local staff are not just loving people who love what they do and love the children, but they are strong believers in Jesus Christ. They sacrifice so much to do the work that they do. We went there one time. We drove out there one time and back to the city, and we were like, I don't think I could do that again. They do that time after time after time after time travel away from their families. They do the hard work because they love Jesus and they love these children. They love these families and they want to build them up and build up these communities and strengthen the local churches there. Several of the staff told us because we said, why do you work with World Vision? And they said, because they allow us and encourage us to be vocal about our faith in Jesus. One of the things we noticed while we were there is just how important clean water is. As Michael said in the worship earlier, probably for all of you this morning, um, you didn't even think about the water in your house. Uh, one of the things they asked us when we were there is how many, listen to this question, how many sources of clean water do you have in your own home? Meaning, how many faucets, how many outlets, how many things you can turn on and get water out of? And Barry and I started doing the math in our own house. Shower, sinks, toilets, refrigerators, dishwasher. You go through all of the sources of water. We got to about 20 in our own house. In one house. And in these villages, they're trying to drill wells, bring in pumps, so there can be one source of clean water for the whole village. They took us on a water walk in a very remote area. So we thought we were remote and then we left there and we went further remote. And they took us to this place where some of the local smaller sub-villages um, would walk to get water. And they would show us in this community, uh, in their tradition, it's the women and the children's, who, the women and the children's responsibility to get water every day. And so they took us to this water source, if you can call it that, where they had walked several miles to fetch water for their families from a polluted water source. Trust me, not only would you not drink this water, you probably wouldn't wash your car with this water. And it was on the side of a hill, and there was like this giant crater that had been developed over time by weather and erosion and those kind of things. And when they had the rainy season, it would all collect in this giant crater, this giant crater. And then through the dry season, the water would get lower and lower and lower as they would 
get water out of this crater. And so by the time we were, we were there, it was toward the end of their dry season and the water was pretty low. And so we went up with them and uh, these women and children had brought, I don't know, maybe 50 five-gallon buckets to, to collect water. And so we crawled up there with them. We saw the crater. Then we had to hike all the way down to where the water was. And there was a line of about 15 of us that was, they were scooping up the water one at a time to the next person, to the next person, the next person, all the way up. And a five-gallon bucket of water is about 40 pounds. These are heavy. So then we would do all this, and then we walked down to where the donkeys were. They had brought donkeys from their village. Because once they filled it all up with water, they put the water buckets on the donkeys, two on each side. And they would then slap the butt of these donkeys, and the donkeys would take off, and the animals were smart enough to know where they were going. They didn't walk them back. They just went back with the water, right? And so this is Barry with some of the women who were there. Um, helping to put the water on the donkeys as they were heading back to the village. Unclean water causes illness for the children, stress on the families, malnutrition, lack of time to do education and other work, and keeps children out of school. Friends, do not take it for granted that you have access to clean water. Because for many, many people around the world, they don't. One of the first things that World Vision Tanzania does is work with the local village to build a water committee. We went to a different village where they had established a pump. They had put in a solar panel so they could power the pump because there wasn't electricity to the village. And they were talking about, they had testimony after testimony of how much their lives had been changed because of access to clean water. We not only saw the importance of clean water, but we saw the impact of Jesus Christ, the living water. Come on, church. One of the leaders that I saw there and talked to for a long time, Simon, uh, was from the same tribal group that this village was that we were visiting. And he said that his, there's a long tradition in this African uh, tribal culture of polygamy. He said that his dad had nine wives and they had 72 children. So he was one of 72 kids. He had changed in his generation and he had one wife and they had like four kids. And I said, how does that change happen? And he had gone on to college, he had gotten a master's degree and now worked at the top level in Tanzania. And we were in this tribal area where he spoke the tribal dialect because it was similar to where he had grown up. And I said, and this guy was brilliant, he was talking all about the development and I said, what changed your life? Listen, What changed your life? What changed your family? What changed from that generation to your generation? How are these remote villages actually going to experience transformation? And he said, that's easy. Two words, Christianity and education. He said, if they can learn the ways of Jesus and learn from Scripture, and we can help educate the next generation. Because listen, we can translate the Bible, we can take the gospel to these communities, but if they can't read... We have to teach them how to read and how to understand what God says, and then they can follow God's ways. So powerful to see how Jesus, the living water, changes generations. And finally, we were encouraged by just seeing World Vision's holistic strategy, mind, body, and soul, that they wanted to help educate the mind, reading, writing, sanitation, health, wellness, all these things that the people there needed to know. They wanted to change their bodies. They needed clean water. One of the big things that that World Vision does when they go into community is they commit that if the kids will come to school, they'll get three meals a day. And of course, in that community, that's a huge deal. And so then they send the kids to school, and now that they have clean water, the kids don't have to go fetch the water so they can go to school and then get three meals a day. And they also help with medical clinics and providing medical care. But then also the soul. They understand that these children need a biblical worldview. And they provide training for the kids and training for pastors in the community. I wanted to just share with you what we saw and how powerful it was. And today, this Reveal Sunday, you can pick up your envelope after service as you go through the lobby. There's kind of a place where you can go. And you pick up your envelope, and inside of your envelope, there'll be two cards. One is a picture of your child who chose you. Woo! I'm tired, y'all. Stop And then there's a deal, another thing from World Vision that just tells you how you can download the World Vision app. And once you download the app on your phone, 
um, and sync it up to your account with your chosen child in there, then you can communicate back and forth with the family and with the child. So you can send letters back and forth from the app. So it's really, really easy to do now. And after we saw the children, children choose their families, uh, they went into a different room and they wrote their first letter to you guys. And so you should be getting that in the mail soon. Thank God for the opportunity to partner with him. Amen. <laughs> Whew. I was really impacted by Peter's testimony last week uh, about his life and how he was changed through sponsorship in Uganda. And I was also challenged, if you weren't here last week, he talked about his involvement with foster parenting and foster care here in the United States. And so, of course, as, as he was sharing, it challenged us to pray through not just how do we support kids halfway around the world, but how do we also sponsor and support kids here in Round Rock and in our community. And we have some partnerships and things that we do, but you'll hear more about that in the days to come. Why has this been so much on my heart this year and the heart of our elders? I think it's because of this. Uh, A, we know how much we've been given. And B, because God is doing something in our community and in our church where we're going to have opportunities to do more in the future, like build another building and raise millions of dollars for ministry here in our community and all that stuff. And it's just, I think it's this connection. It's it's Galatians 2. In Galatians 2, the Apostle Paul goes to talk to the leaders in Jerusalem. He tells the story of after he became a Christian. Nobody trusted him because he used to be Saul and he was killing Christians. But he went to meet with the leaders of the early church in Jerusalem. And he met with Peter, James, and John. And he's telling them about what God did in his life. And he's asking for direction about his ministry to the Gentiles. Just stay with me. And in Galatians 2, it says, They gave me their blessing to go and to do my calling to take the gospel to the Gentiles as they also fulfilled their calling to take the gospel to the Jews. And then in Galatians 2 verse 10, it says this, Paul says, the only thing they told me, they said, make sure you remember the poor, which I was very eager to do. That verse has just been sitting on my heart. Because it's like the early church leaders said, we've got mission, we got to go do. I got to go to the Gentiles, you guys go to the Jews, we got to plant churches, we got to make disciples, we got to reach the nations. But let us, as we do that, not forget the poor. I think that's so important to the heart of God. And so I want to encourage us as a church family that as we continue to build our ministry and as we steward the resources God's given us and the property he's given us here and all the ministries that he's given us to do in our community, which God is using and blessing, let us make sure we also are open-handed with those who are in need, especially children. Being a globally-minded church involves giving. But it also involves more than giving. It involves praying, sponsoring, supporting, and going. Today, in addition to being our Reveal Sunday, we want to talk to you about going. Because God's heart for the nations is that, yes, we support what God is doing around the world, but we also go. We have had so many people over the years who have gone on a mission trip for the first time ever in their life with City View Bible Church. And I love, love, love those testimonies. Because here's what you realize when you go around the world. Is that God is using you to minister to others. To be able to look somebody in the face. And say, God sent me here to tell you that he loves you. That he made you. That he sent his son, Jesus, to die for you. And to rise from the dead. So that your sins could be forgiven You can be reconciled to God and you can spend eternity with him. And I am coming here from halfway around the world just to tell you how much God loves you, that he would do that for you. That's so powerful. But here's what you realize after you go, is that God uses that not just to change that person's life, but he changes your life. Did you hear me, church? He changes your life. That as you go, you get a bigger vision of God. You get a bigger vision of God's heart and you see that God loves them and he loves you. He loves you that he would send you with something so beautiful and so wonderful as his good news to share with the world. How amazing that he allows us to partner with him. We've always been a mission-minded church because we want every person locally and globally to hear, see, and respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ. We want people to see the love of Christ in us and hear the gospel of Christ 
from us. And so we give, we share, we make disciples, we plant churches here in Austin and around the world. Today I want to share God's heart with you for the nations and tell you what he wants you to do in response to that. Will you stand with me as we read Psalm 67 together? Uh, This verse means a whole lot to me and to Barry. Uh, Psalm 67, 1 and 2 are our life verses as a family. It's on the wall of our house. I have a ring that was made in Israel that has these two verses in Hebrew on it. I just share that with you to say this is very important to us. Here's what it says. May God be gracious to us and bless us. May he make his face shine upon us so that... Your way may be known on earth, your salvation among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations rejoice and shout for joy. For you judge the peoples with fairness and lead the nations on earth. Let the peoples praise you, God, Let all the peoples praise you. The earth has produced its harvest. God, our God, blesses us. God will bless us. And all the ends of the earth will fear him. Thank you, Lord, for your word today. Help us to understand it and respond to it in a way that honors you, Jesus. In your name we pray, amen. Amen, you can be seated. Thank you. I want to share with you five commands of God's global mandate for his church. Five commands that I believe God gives to us and how we can respond to his global mandate. Because Psalm 67 says that God wants all the nations to rejoice and to know him and to praise him. How do we get there? The first command from God is to care. Come on, church, we gotta care. Do we care? The Bible says that God loves all people everywhere. The famous passage from John 3.16, that God loves the world in this way, that he sent his one and only son, that whoever would believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. God loves the world in this way that he sent his son to die for every single person on this planet. And then Jesus commands us as his followers to love God and love our neighbor. When he's asked, what's the most important commandment? He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Friends, here's the truth. We won't give and we won't go and we won't pray if we don't love people. If we don't love people the way God loves people, we won't go. You see, here's the question I have for you this morning. Is your heart moved when you think about people? When's the last time your heart was broken for the needs of the world? When's the last time your heart was broken for the needs of your neighbor? When's the last time your heart was broken because you knew there was someone who woke up in the morning, went through their day, and went to bed, and did not and will not hear the gospel of Jesus? Does that move your heart? Do we have a deep love within us for the people of the world and for our next door neighbors. I believe it starts with caring. Second, God calls us to give. He calls us to give. We've already talked about this at length as a church family, to first of all, help people in need. I've already shared Galatians 2.10 with you this morning, but there is a pattern that I have begun, begun to see in the New Testament where Paul, in his missionary travels, is going from city to city, and he will talk about making a collection in those places 
for the people who were in poverty and experiencing famine in other places. Let me say that again. We see a pattern in the New Testament of the church collecting their resources for people in need in other places. Not only is it in Galatians 2, but we see it in 1 Corinthians and in 2 Corinthians 8, 13 to 15, where Paul says, our abundance is given to us to share with the world. Or as Michael said earlier, we're called to give to God from our overflow. Our overflow of physical abundance, I'm not here to make you feel bad because you have 20 water sources in your house. Praise God for that, that you have abundant clean water. But we are to ask the question, God, what do you want me to do with the abundance you've given me? What do you want me to do with the abundant water and food and money and clothing? And what I believe God is showing us is when we have abundance of material provision and we see somebody with a lack of material provision, we are willing to share. Do you agree with that? Whether that's somebody here locally or somebody halfway around the world. But it's not just material provision. Listen, it's spiritual provision. You probably have multiple copies of the Bible at your house on your shelf of different Bible translations. For sure you have it on your phone. You and I have abundant spiritual resources. We have great churches. We have the gospel. We have leadership. We have training. We have knowledge of God's word. We have Bibles. We have books. We have all this abundance of resource. And listen, there are still spiritually dark places all over the world that have no Bible, have no gospel, have no church. And so again, what will we do with the abundance we have? Will we be consumers of spiritual resources and just sit back and evaluate and go, well, this church has that and that church has this and this Bible has this and the Bible. Will we just be consumers or will we say, we have been given an abundance, God, and there are people who lack and so we will give from the abundance we have to make sure there is not spiritual darkness. We will give to help people in need and we will give to spread the gospel to all people. Psalm 67 verse two says that your way may be known on earth, your salvation among all nations. You see, listen, we love Psalm 67 one. Yes, God bless us. God make your face shine upon us. We love that, right? How many of you, when I read verse one, you're like, oh, I remember that verse. I love that verse. May God be gracious to us and bless us. Make his face shine upon us. Yeah, I know that verse. I love that verse. But don't miss the so that. So that your salvation would be known to all nations. Why is God blessing us? Because people need Jesus. They need the Bible in their own language. They need to be able to read the Bible in their language. They need strong churches with strong families, with strong Christians. And friends, there are people globally without the gospel. May that break our heart. So we give because we care, but we also pray. God says to us, as you care, as you give, make sure you're praying. We want to pray, first of all, that all nations and people would turn to the Lord. 67 verse 4 says, let the nations rejoice, shout for joy, because you, God, judge the peoples with fairness and you lead the nations on the earth. We want to pray over the nations because we believe that God is sovereign over the nations. We believe that there is not one square inch, as Abraham Abraham Kuyper would say, there's not one square inch on this planet that Jesus Christ does not say, mine. So the point is, is you go to the ends of the earth. You fly 35 hours in an airplane. You drive three hours in a truck. You drive off-road for hours to get to a village and you step out of that vehicle and Jesus is already there. He's already there because all of that belongs to him. And so we pray for all the nations. Say, well, how do I pray for the nations? Keith, I don't even know what the nations are, (laughs) much less to how to pray for them. I give this recommendation often, but make sure you connect to the Joshua Project. The Joshua Project is a website, it's an app, it's an organization that gives us ways to pray for the nations. I get a daily email from the Joshua Project, you can sign up for it on their website, where they send me information and a few bullet points of how to pray for an unreached people group in the world. Let me encourage you, let us pray that God will bring the nations to him. But let us also pray that more people will go. Go. 
Jesus says to us, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. We need to pray into that reality. We need to pray that people will hear the call of God and respond to the call of God to go. Because when you go to the ends of the earth, here's what, here's what will happen. You will realize this is hard. It is hard to go to these places. It is hard to live in these places. It is hard to make the gospel known in these places. And who would go to these places unless, unless they have heard from the Holy Spirit, I want you to go. And so let us pray that God would raise up more workers to go into the harvest. God commands us care. He commands us give. He commands us to pray. He commands us to send. We have to send. We have to send people to share Jesus. Romans 10 is a key verse when it comes to global missions work. Paul says this in Romans 10, verses 14 and 15. He says, how then can they call on him they have not believed in? And how can they believe without hearing about him? And how can they hear without a preacher? And how can they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. He says it's important that people hear, and for them to hear, people have to share the good news, and and before people will share, people have to send. The headwater for Paul of global missions is the sending church, a church that will send people to the nations. You might be hearing me talk about driving three hours on a dirt road and your body starts hurting just thinking about it. And you're thinking, I can't go. I got this physical ailment, I got this issue, I got this problem, I got this challenge, whatever. Maybe you can't go, but you can send. You can send. You can pray for somebody. You can send money with somebody to make sure they can go to the ends of the earth. You can sponsor people to go. We have missionaries from City View all over the world. They need our support. If you can't go, you can still connect with a missionary. You can get their prayer letters. You can get updates from them. You can send them gifts at the holidays. You can pray for them. You can encourage them. You can give them somewhere to stay when they come home for for a time off. There are all these things we can do to send people to the nations. And we also wanna partner with the Holy Spirit. I love Acts 13, where the Spirit of God is calling people. And it says that the church leaders in Antioch got together and they said, it seems good to the Holy Spirit and to us. And so they sent. Are we listening to the Holy Spirit and sending people to the nations? And finally, God calls us to go. Jesus says in Matthew 28, go and make disciples of all nations. He commands his disciples, that's us who believe in Jesus, he commands us to go to all people groups with the gospel. We have a global mandate from our Lord and Savior to go to the nations. This is not a creative program that City View has come up with. This is not like our leadership got together and said, hey, we know, we, you know what would be great? If we could just send some people to Tanzania. That is not how this came up. It didn't come up because we are creative or innovative. It came up because we are obedient. Because Jesus said 2,000 years ago when the whole movement was like a few hundred people, He said to his disciples, go to the nations. And that's why we are sitting here today in Round Rock, Texas, 2,000 years later, worshiping Jesus together because they went. And so will we go. Now I'll tell you what this requires and you'll be able to connect the dots. It requires courageous faith. See where I'm going? We've been talking this year about courageous faith. Because you will feel all kind of fear about going. Well, I don't speak that language. I don't know how I'd do on a 16-hour flight. I don't know how my kids would do if I leave and they stay behind. You see, all these issues cause us fear. Would I even be able to eat the food in that place? I mean, they don't have bluebell, they don't have queso. How am I gonna survive? Are you willing to go? I know you think you can't go, but you can. I know you think you couldn't survive, but you would. 
I know you think you don't have the ability. You don't have the knowledge. You don't have the expertise. Everybody feels that way before the first time they go. And then you go and God changes your life. Listen to these stories from City View members. My name is Carmine Spells, and I've been going to City View for three years. I've always had the desire to like go on a mission trip, but I did give myself like excuses like, oh, I'm too busy. Financially, I don't know if I'd be able to afford it. It's like really good to hear about how a church is doing work, but it's even more beautiful the moment that you get to like be a participant of it. You won't realize how much you needed it. It was for you. God wanted you in that place to speak to you, to have that time with you. My name is Liam Crow, and I've been going to City View since like first grade or so, and that's 10 or 11 years. Before I went on a mission trip, I was pretty scared to go on one. I was just like, that's unknown territory, and I'm kind of afraid of doing new things. I realized that even though I wasn't capable, God was. And so that was a, a big thing that really changed my heart. It just helps to understand that you're not going alone. You have, you're going with a group. You have people to support you, to be strong for you. You're not alone. You're going together. Hi, my name is Justin Chomel, and I've been at City View since June of 2019. The first couple times that I shared my faith, the people of Southeast Asia were just so welcoming and open to listen to my message. It kind of really let me know that, you know, I can bring my guard down and begin sharing my faith. So to share your faith with someone who's never heard the name of Jesus is pretty remarkable. I viewed myself as a baby Christian and not really like a super Christian like Paul. And when I shared with men in Costa Rica and we had a vulnerable moment, what that has come to is a relationship with those men where we're going back now and want to go back repeatedly. That makes me want to increase my knowledge and my faith and so that I can bring more to the Bree Bree men and really begin to create a larger movement in that area. The Lord's already working. Does that make sense? All you're doing when you're going on mission is just going right into the flow of what He's already doing. Now that I've tasted a little bit of that freedom, I don't leave it just there. I make sure I bring it back home with me. I can go on a trip, I can get a group together, we can go do something and make change. Things are possible when you work together, you know? If you're worried about going on a trip, you're like, do I have the time? Do I have the resources? God is gonna provide because he cares about you. I had heard this great quote from the stage of sometimes you have to go halfway around the world to go across the street. It's really the work in me and now my increased confidence to share my faith here in my community, at work, wherever I may be. And so I'm really grateful for that. Knowing that you have a big God behind you, you should walk in it boldly. It's powerful, it's life-changing, and a lot of the prayers that we ask, it comes with a tough yes. Tough for us, but easy for God. People around you will rally and financially support you, which is giving them an opportunity to be part of what you're doing. There are some people who literally can't go. If you're sitting on the fence, you probably can go. Allow those people to support you and be part of it. To not have tried one yet, I mean, you're missing out. <laughs> Amen. Like Liam said, if you haven't gone, you're missing out. So what is your part? Let me encourage you to find a trip in 2025 that you can go on, that you can participate with us in mission around the world. Uh, you can always find the current list of all of our Go Trips on our church website at our Outreach Ministries page. So especially if you're online today uh, watching with us, go to the website, go to the Outreach page, and you can find all the current available trips. But for those of you who are here today, of course, grab your reveal envelope as you leave the service this morning, but also stop by the Global Outreach table and meet some of our leaders who are leading trips, learn more about the trips that are coming up, and see if God doesn't move your heart to sign up for one of them and to participate. Trips are available for families, for men, 
for women, for young adults, for youth, for couples, for whole life groups. Trip activities include evangelism, supporting church planning, providing help for marginalized people, teaching and leading conferences, doing children's ministry, construction. My point is, is we do a lot of different things in a lot of different places, and you can find a trip where God can use your skills and your gifts to help build up his global church. As Jay likes to say, all you need is a passport and courageous faith. Will you all stand with me as we finish our service together today? As we close out this morning, my prayer is that we would not just be hearers of the word, but doers. Where is God calling you to participate with him around the world? I want to pray a benediction over you directly from Psalm 67. May these verses get deep into our hearts as the people of Jesus, okay? So, uh, leaders, elders, prayer team, I'm going to ask after we pray, y'all come down front. If you need prayer after service, we'd love to pray for you. But for all of you, make sure you grab your reveal card and that you talk to our GO team. Okay, let me pray this benediction over you from Psalm 67. May God be gracious to you and bless you. May he make his face shine upon you so that God's ways may be known on the earth, his salvation among all the nations. God, we love you, we bless you, and we are so grateful today that we get to be a part of what you're doing all over the world. What a privilege. Jesus, I love this church, and I know you love them even more. Please watch over them this week in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Be blessed. Love you.